Okay, tonight is the 26th of July, and this is the 11th night we are talking on the Diga Nikaya Suttas. Huh? Tonight we come to Sutta number 16, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Of all the suttas, the Buddhas, uh, of all the suttas uh, recorded, uh, the longest is this one, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. And uh, there are many incidents inside here uh, mentioned uh, concerning the last days of the Buddha. Uh, so it's not like other suttas where it's just one talk. This one is not, this one is uh, many, many days. Uh, uh. Thus have I heard. Once the Lord was staying at Rajagaha on the mountain called Vulture's Peak, Gijakuta. Now just then, King Ajatasattu, Vedehi Putta of Magadha, wanted to attack the virgins. He said, I will strike the virgins who are so powerful and strong. I will cut them off and destroy them. I will bring them to ruin and destruction. And King Ajatasattu said to his chief minister, the Brahmin Vasakara, Brahmin, go to the Blessed Lord, worship him with your head, to his feet in my name. Ask if he is free from sickness or disease, if he is living at ease, vigorously and comfortably. And then say, Lord, King Ajatasattu Vadehi Putta of Magadha wishes to attack the Vajans and says, I will strike the Vajans who are so powerful and strong. I will cut them off and destroy them. I will bring them to ruin and destruction. And whatever the Lord declares to you, report that faithfully back to me, for Tathagatas never lie. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So you can see from here, uh, this King Ajata Satu uh, is a very ambitious king. Uh. He's not uh, uh, content uh, with his own kingdom. Uh. He wants to seize the Vajin kingdom. Uh. And he's not sure whether he can succeed. Uh. So he wanted to know what the Buddha has to say. Uh. Very good, sire, said Vasakara, and having had the state carriages harnessed, he mounted one of them and drove in state from Rajagaha to Vulture's Peak, riding as far as the ground would allow, then continuing on foot to where the Lord was. He exchanged courtesies with the Lord, then sat down to one side and delivered the king's message. Now the Venerable Ananda was standing behind the Lord, fanning him, and the Lord said, Ananda, have you heard that the Vajans hold regular and frequent assemblies? And remember Ananda said, I have heard, Lord, that they do. Ananda, as long as the Vajans hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajans meet in harmony, break up in harmony, and carry on their business in harmony? I have heard, Lord, that they do. Ananda, as long as the Vajans meet in harmony, break up in harmony, and carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajans do not authorize what has not been authorized already, and do not abolish what has been authorized, but proceed according to what has been authorized by their ancient tradition? I have, Lord. Have you heard that they honour, respect, revere and salute the elders among them and consider them worth listening to? I have, Lord. That they do not forcibly abduct others' wives and daughters and compel them to live with them. And again, uh, remember Ananda said, I have, Lord. That they honour, respect, revere and salute the Vajin shrines at home and abroad, not withdrawing the proper support made and given before. Again, remember Ananda said, yes, Lord that proper provision is made for the safety of Arahans, so that such Arahans may come in future to live there, and those already there may dwell in comfort. I have, Lord. Ananda, so long as such proper uh, provision is made, etc., the Vajans may be expected to prosper and not decline. So here, when the Buddha was asked, uh, whether this uh, King Ajata Satu uh, will succeed uh, in uh, uh, conquering the Vajans, uh, the Buddha indirectly uh, gave the answer. Uh, 
whether they follow these uh, conditions uh, of harmony and unity uh, and if they do uh, then uh, uh, they will prosper uh, and they cannot uh, decline uh. then the Lord said to Brahmin Vasakara once Brahmin when I was at the Sarandada shrine in Vesali I taught the Vajans these seven principles for preventing decline and as long as they keep to these seven principles as long as these principles remain in force the Vajans may be expected to prosper and not decline at this Vasakara replied Reverend Gautama if the Vajans keep to even one of these principles may, they may be expected to prosper and not decline far less all seven Certainly, the Vajans will never be conquered by King Ajatasattu by force of arms, but only by means of propaganda and setting them against one another. And now, Reverend Gautama, may I depart. I, have, I am busy and have much to do. And the Buddha said, Brahmin, do as you think fit. Then Vasakara, rejoicing and re delighted at the Lord's words, rose from his seat and departed. Soon after Vasakara had gone, the Lord said, Ananda, go to whatever monks there are round about Rajagaha and summon them to the assembly hall. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and did so. Stop here for a moment. You see, during the Buddha's time, uh, the monks who lived uh, dependent on a particular town, uh, like Rajagaha, they might be living in the hills, in the valleys, in the caves, and all that. Lah. And around Rajagaha, there were several hills. Lah. I, uh, several hills are mentioned in the suttas. Lah. So, in the Vinaya, if they all come to Rajagaha for their arms round, lah, they are considered one Sangha. <clears throat> so, the Sima is the uh, boundary lah, around that area. Lah where all the monks constitute one Sangha. Uh, so that is the real meaning of Sima, la, the boundary. La. But later monks, uh, they want to exclude other monks. Uh, they start to shrink the Sima. Shrink, shrink, until now they talk about Sima Hall. But in fact, there's no such thing as Sima Hall during the Buddha's time. Uh, and during the Buddha's time, uh, uh, what is considered Sima Hall now uh, was called Uposatha Gara. That means uh, the hall uh, where people do the uposatha, uh, chant the precepts uh, and carry out ordination and all that. Uh. So the real name uh, is uposatha gara. Nowadays people keep talking about sima hall, sima hall. It's a wrong term to use. Uh. So uh, that's the meaning of sima. Uh. Very good Lord, said Ananda, and did so. Then he came to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side, and said, Lord, the Sangha of monks is assembled. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he sees fit. Then the Lord rose from his seat, went to the assembly hall, sat down on the prepared seat, and said, Monks, I will teach you seven things that are conducive to welfare. Listen, pay careful attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said the monks. And the Lord said, As long as the monks hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they meet in harmony, break up in harmony, and carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they do not authorize what has not been authorized already, and do not abolish what has been authorized, but proceed according to what has been authorized by the rules of training. As long as they honor, respect, revere, and salute the elders of long standing, who are long ordained, fathers and leaders of the Sangha, as long as they do not fall prey to desires which arise in them and lead to rebirth, as long as they are devoted to forest lodgings, as long as they preserve their personal mindfulness so that in future, the good among their companions will come to them, and those who have already come will feel at ease with them. So long as the monks hold to these seven things and are seen to do so, 
they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So just now earlier we heard about the seven conditions uh, for a particular uh, community of people, uh, a certain race, uh, a certain country, uh, if they uh, practice those seven conditions, uh, they will prosper, uh, nobody can conquer them. Uh. Now the Buddha modifies the seven conditions uh, for the Sangha of monks uh, and enumerates these seven conditions. Uh. Uh, these seven conditions are very important. Uh, if any group of people uh, they want to prosper uh, and not uh, have uh, this downfall uh, or be conquered by others, uh, then they should practice these seven conditions. Uh. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as the monks do not rejoice, delight, and become absorbed in works, I mean, it's too much working, too much uh, in chattering, in talking too much. Uh. I see some of you uh, come here, supposed to practice uh, the holy life. Uh, some of you talk too much. Uh, uh, eating time, breakfast, you're talking. Lunch, you're talking. Outside, in the veranda, you're talking. As long as you do not rejoice, delight, and become absorbed in sleeping, in company, uh, keeping too much company, uh, in evil desires, in mixing and associating with evil friends, as long as they do not rest content with partial achievements, as long as the monks hold to these seven things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as monks continue with faith, with modesty, with fear of wrongdoing, with learning, with aroused vigor, with established mindfulness, with wisdom, so long they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as monks develop the enlightenment factors of mindfulness, of investigation, of dhamma, of energy, of delight, tranquility, concentration, equanimity, so long they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as the monks develop the perception of impermanence, of no, no self or non-self, huh? of Im loathsomeness, of the danger of overcoming, of dispassion, cessation, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Hmm. So, uh, as far as the Sangha is concerned, uh, first uh, Buddha said uh, uh, that uh, they should meet regularly. La. Mm. And then when they meet, uh, they should not quarrel with each other, la, but meet in harmony and, and in harmony. La. And then do not change what has been authorized already. La. And then uh, honor and respect uh, the senior, seniors, la, elders of long standing. La. And then do not fall prey to desires. La, uh, and then devoted to forest lodgings, uh, seclude, seclusion, uh, which nowadays a lot of monks don't practice. Uh, seclusion means staying in uh, secluded places, uh, away from the cities and towns. Uh. As long as they preserve their personal mindfulness. Uh, etc. So then another seven things. Uh, as long as they do not uh, indulge too much in work, talking, sleeping, mixing with company, evil desires, associating with evil friends, uh, uh, content with their attainments, uh, then they may be, uh, then they will prosper. Uh, as long as, now there seven conditions, uh, as long as they have faith, modesty, uh, modesty uh, includes uh, humility. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when they are new to the monastery, uh, they, they are modest, uh, they are humble. Sometimes uh, uh, people stay in the monastery too long uh, and they become arrogant. Uh, with fear of doing wrong, with learning, with aroused vigor, with mindfulness, with wisdom. Uh, and as long as they practice the seven enlightenment factors, uh, they may prosper. Uh, as long as they develop the 
perception of impermanence lah. Always aware eh, that life is impermanent. Eh. Anything can happen to your body. Anything ha- can happen to your life lah. Don't be too sure of yourself lah. Uh, of no self, of loathsomeness of the body, of the danger. Uh, uh, danger can mean danger to life, danger to your uh, whatever you are con- you are uh, content with lah. Your all your property, etc. Mm. Uh, dispassion, cessation, etc. Monks, I will tell you six things that are conducive to communal living. As long as monks, both in public and in private, show loving kindness to their fellows in acts of body, speech and thought, share with their virtuous fellows whatever they receive as rightful gift, including the contents of their arms bowl, which they do not keep to themselves. Keep consistently unbroken and unaltered those rules of conduct that are spotless, leading to liberation, praised by the wise, unstained and conducive to concentration, and persist therein with their fellows, both in public and in private. Continue in that noble view that leads to liberation, to the utter destruction of suffering, remaining in such awareness with their fellows, both in public and in private. As long as monks hold to these six things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. So here, when uh, people live together, uh, they should practice these few things. Uh, I find some people don't know how to practice uh, loving kindness uh, towards others uh, in body, speech and mind. Uh, and uh, share whatever this one uh, is for monks, uh, share whatever they receive uh, with other monks. Uh, and uh, and then the sila, those rules of conduct uh, uh, to keep uh, purely. Uh, mm. And then the right view, uh, to have that right view uh, uh, so that uh, you don't uh, act wrongly. Uh, mm. So these are the six things uh, that are conducive to harmony, to communal living, uh, living together. Uh, everyone must practice these six things. Uh, uh. And then the Lord, while staying at Vulture's Peak, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the asavas, that is, from the asava of sensuality, of becoming, of false views and of ignorance. And when the Lord had stayed at Rajagaha as long as he wished, he said to the venerable Ananda, Come, Ananda, let us go to Ambalatika. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went there with a large company of monks. And the Lord stayed in the royal park at Ambalatika. And there he delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. Having stayed at Ambalatika as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, Let us go to Nalanda. And they did so. At Nalanda, the Lord stayed at Pavarika's mango grove. Then the Venerable Sariputta came to see the Lord, saluted him and sat down to one side and said, It is clear to me, Lord, that there never has been, will be, or is now another ascetic or Brahmin who is better or more enlightened than the Lord. And the Buddha said, You have spoken boldly with a bull's voice, Sariputta. You have roared the lion's roar of certainty. How is this? Have all the Arahant Buddhas of the past appeared to you? And were the minds of all those lords open to you, so as to say, These lords were of such virtue, such was their teaching, such their wisdom, such their way, such their liberation? No, Lord. And have you perceived all the Arahant Buddhas who will appear in the future? No, Lord. Well then, Sariputta, you know me as the Arahant Buddha. And do you know the Lord is of such virtue? Such is his teaching, such is wisdom, such is way, such is liberation. No, Lord. So, Sariputta, you do not 
have knowledge of the minds of the Buddhas of the past, the future or the present. Thus, Sariputta, have you not spoken boldly with a bull's voice and wrought the lion's roar of certainty with your declaration? Stop here for a moment. Uh. So this is Venerable Sariputta. He has so much faith uh, in our Buddha Gautama uh, that he says uh, there cannot be another Buddha better than our Buddha Gautama. Uh. So the Buddha asks him, do you have the psychic power to read the minds of the past Buddhas uh, or of the future Buddhas uh, or of my mind? And he said, no. Lord, the minds of the Arhan Buddhas of the past, future and present are not open to me, but I know the drift or the way of the Dhamma. Lord, it is as if there were a royal frontier city with mighty bastions and a mighty encircling wall in which was a single gate, at which was a gatekeeper, wise, skilled and clever, who kept out strangers and let in those he knew. And he, constantly patrolling and following along a path, might not see the joints and clefts in the bastion, even such as a cat might creep through. But, but whatever larger creatures entered or left the city, all must go through this very gate. And it seems to me, Lord, that the drift of the Dhamma is the same. All those Arahan Buddhas of the past attain to supreme enlightenment by abandoning the five hindrances, defilements of mind that weaken the understanding, having firmly established the four, four intense states of mindfulness in their minds and realize the seven factors of enlightenment as they really are. All the Arahan Buddhas of the future will do likewise, and you, Lord, who are now the Arahan Samasam Buddha, have done the same. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, uh, Venerable Sariputta is saying, huh? uh, whatever Buddhas of the past and the future, huh? they all attain huh? enlightenment, huh? just like our Buddha Gautama, huh? abandoning the five hindrances, huh? and... Uh, uh, having practiced uh, the uh, four intense states of mindfulness, seven factors of enlightenment, etc. Uh, so uh, they cannot be better than our, our Buddha. Uh, at the most, they can just equal him uh, since they practice the same thing. Then while staying at Nalanda in Pavarika's mango grove, the Lord gave a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. And having stayed at Nalanda as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, Let us go to Patali Gama. And they did so. At Patali Gama, they heard say, The Lord has arrived here. And the lay followers of Patali Gama came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side, and said, May the Lord consent to stay at our rest house. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passing him by to the right, went to the rest house and strewed the floor, prepared seats, provided a water pot, and filled the oil lamp. Then they went to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side, and said, All is ready at the rest house, Lord. Now is the time to do as the Lord wishes. Then the Lord dressed took his robe and bowl, and went with his monks to the rest house, where he washed his feet, went in and sat down facing east, with his back against the central pillar. And the monks, having washed their feet, went in and sat down with their backs to the west wall, facing east, and with the Lord sitting in front of them. And the lay followers of Patali Gama, having washed their feet, went in and sat down with their backs to the east wall, facing west, and with the Lord before them. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So you see uh, the, the Buddha, uh, when he sits, uh, he likes to sit facing east. Uh. This is the Hindu and yoga tradition uh, when uh, uh, these uh, yogis, they meditate, uh, they like to face east uh, where the sun rises. Uh. And I guess it's because the direction of rotation of the earth, uh, you are facing east, uh, it's like you are sitting in a car uh, facing the front, uh, the car is moving, you're facing the front, uh, it's more comfortable. Uh, uh. Then the Lord addressed the lay followers of Patali Gama, Householders, there are these five perils to one of bad morality, of failure in morality. What are they? In the first place, he suffers great loss of property through neglecting his affairs. 
In the second place, he gets a red, bad reputation for immorality and misconduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Katyas, Brahmins, householders or ascetics, he does so diffidently and shyly. In the fourth place, he dies confused. In the fifth place, after death, at the breaking up of the body, he arises in an evil state, a bad fate, in suffering and hell. These are the five perils to one of bad morality. And householders, these, there are five advantages to one of good morality and of success in morality. What are they? In the first place, through careful attention to his affairs, he gains much wealth. In the second place, he gets a good reputation for morality and good conduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Katiyas, Brahmins, householders or ascetics, he does so with confidence and assurance. In the fourth place, he dies unconfused. In the fifth place, after death, at the breaking up of the body, he arises in a good place, a heavenly world. These are the five advantages to one of good morality and of success in morality. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted the lay followers of Patali Gama. We talk on Dhamma until far into the night. Then he dismissed them, saying, Householders, the night is nearly over. Now it is time for you to do as you think fit. Very good, Lord, they said. And rising and saluting the Lord, they passed him by to the right and departed. And the Lord spent the remainder of the night in the rest house, left empty by their departure. Stop here for a moment. So you see, the Buddha, having attained enlightenment, he used to walk from place to place in India. And each place he went, he would teach the Dhamma so that people would understand. But you notice, like in Patali Gama here, that night, he only talked about morality, the five advantages and disadvantages of practicing or not practicing um, sila, la, moral conduct. La, uh, and um, if a person does not have sila, practice moral conduct, uh, then uh, he will kill, steal, uh, com- uh, 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 engage in sexual misconduct, lie and cheat. La, uh, so, so if he does that, la, firstly, yeah, uh, his, uh, he will lose his wealth. Uh, for example, if a person spends his time uh, drinking away, uh, getting drunk all the time, uh, or uh, going out at night uh, uh, to all the joints to, to, to take drugs and all this, uh, then he neglects his duties. Uh, so he will lose all his wealth. Uh. Secondly, you get a bad reputation. Uh, uh, if somebody has uh, uh, bad morals, uh, then uh, um, nobody wants to marry him. Uh, uh, yes, mm. nobody wants to do business with him also, uh, because he, they they know uh, he cannot be trusted. Uh, uh, if he drinks, if he gambles too much, uh, uh, etc. Uh, mm. And then the third place, uh, in the third place, uh, because of not uh, keeping uh, his sila properly. Uh, uh, he's shy to meet a lot of people. Uh, for example, if a person is a drug peddler, uh, and then uh, he knows uh, he's doing something that he's not supposed to do. Uh, he doesn't like people to know, and he doesn't like to meet people. Uh. In the fourth place, uh, he dies confused. Uh, when he's dying, uh, the mind is very disturbed. Uh. Uh, sila uh, is very important. Uh, we we have uh, don't practice sila, uh, then we harm other living beings. Uh. And when we are dying, uh, uh, this guilty conscience uh, will prick us. Uh, those people that you, or those beings that you kill, uh, animals and all that, uh, you probably see them coming to you uh, when you are dying. Um, and then the fifth place, uh, after dying, uh, you, take, you get a bad rebirth uh, for not keeping seal. Uh. Now at this time, Sunida and Vasakara, the Magadan ministers, were building a fortress in Patali Gama as a defense against the Vajans. And at that time, a multitude of thousands of devas were taking up lodging at Patali Gama. And in, parts, and in the parts where powerful devas settled, they caused the minds of the most powerful royal officials to pick those sites for their dwellings. And where middle and lower ranking devas settled, 
They, so too, they caused the minds of royal officials of corresponding grade to pick those sites for their dwellings. And the Lord, with his divine eye surpassing that of humans, saw the thousands of devas taking up residence in Patali Gama. And getting up at break of day, he said to the venerable Ananda, Ananda, who is building a fortress at Patali Gama? Ananda replied, Lord, Sunida and Vasakara, the Magadan ministers, are building a fortress against the Vajins. And the Buddha said, Ananda, just as if they had taken counsel with the 33 gods, Sunida and Vasakara are building a fortress at Patali Gama. I have seen with my divine eye how thousands of devas were taking up lodging there. And then the Buddha explained uh, where powerful devas settled, uh, they cause powerful humans to go there also, uh, where middle-ranking middle, middle ranking devas settle, uh, stay. Uh, they also cause middle-ranking humans to stay there. Uh, and low-ranking devas uh, will cause low-ranking humans uh, to stay uh, together. Uh, mm. Ananda, as far as the Aryan realm extends, as far as, as its uh, trade extends, this will be the chief city, Pataliputta, scattering its seeds far and wide. And Pataliputta will face three perils from fire, from water, and from internal dissension. Uh, stop here for a moment. So the Buddha uh, foresaw uh, that uh, this town that they are building, uh, called Patali Gama, in the future uh, will be a big prosperous city uh, called Pataliputta. Uh. I think even up to today, uh, it's a big city. La. Then Sunida and Vasakara called on the Lord and having exchanged courtesies, stood to one side and said, May the Reverend Gautama accept a meal from us tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, Sunida and Vasakara went home and there had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared. When it was ready, they reported to the Lord, Reverend Gautama, the meal is ready. Then the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl, went with the Asanga of monks to the residence of Sunida and Vasakara, and sat down on the prepared seat. Then Sunida and Vasakara served the Buddha and his Sangha of monks with choice, soft and hard foods, till they were satisfied. And when the Lord took his hand away from the bowl, they sat down on low stools to one side. And as they sat there, the Lord thanked them with these verses. In whatever realm the wise man makes his home, he should feed the virtuous leaders of the holy life. Whatever devas there are who report this offering, they will pay him respect and honor for this. They tremble for him as a mother for her son. And he for whom devas tremble, ever happy is. Then the Lord rose from his seat and took his departure. Sunida and Vasakara followed closely behind the Lord, saying, Whichever gate the ascetic Gotama goes out by today, that shall be called the Gotama gate. And whichever fort he uses to cross the Ganges, that shall be called the Gotama fort. And so the gate by which the Lord went out was called the Gotama gate. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that if a family uh, or certain person uh, makes constant uh, offerings uh, of, of food, etc., uh, to um, holy men, uh, to, to those who lead the holy life, uh, uh, ascetics, monks, etc., uh, then the devas will protect him. Uh, uh. So it is by our actions uh, that we are blessed. Uh. And it's, it's by our evil actions uh, that we are cursed. Uh. Nobody can bless another, nobody can curse another. Uh. It's our actions that decide. Uh. Good actions will bless us, evil actions curse us. Uh. And then the Lord came to the river Ganges. And just then the, rivers, the river was so full that a crow could drink out of it. And some people were looking for a boat, some were looking for a raft. Some were binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. But the Lord, as swiftly as a strong man might stretch out his flexed arm or flex it again, vanished from this side of the Ganges and reappeared with his Sangha of monks on the other shore. And the Lord saw those people who were looking for a boat, looking for a raft, and binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. 
and seeing their intentions, he uttered this verse on the spot. When they want to cross the sea, the lake or pond, people make a bridge or raft. The wise have crossed already. The Lord said to Ananda, Let us go to Koti Gama. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Koti Gama and stayed there. Then the Lord addressed the monks thus, Monks, it is through not understanding, not penetrating the four noble truths that I, as well as you, have for a long time run on and gone round the cycle of birth and death. What are they? By not understanding the noble truth of suffering, we have fared on. By not understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, we have fared on round the cycle of birth and death. And by the understanding, penetration of the same noble truth of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the craving for becoming has been cut off. The support for becoming or being has been destroyed. There is no more re-becoming. The Lord having said this, the welfarer having spoken, the teacher said, not seeing the four noble truths as they are, having long traversed the round from life to life, these being seen, becoming supports pulled up, sorrows root cut off, rebirth is done. Uh, so here the Buddha says, uh, we keep on the, the round of rebirths, uh, samsara, because we don't understand, don't really understand uh, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, when a person really understands the Four Noble Truths, uh, then he becomes tired uh, of this long round of existence. Uh. The Buddha says, uh, we have been on this long round of existence for so long, uh, uh, we don't realize, uh, so long that uh, if we accumulated uh, uh, for example, the blood that was shed uh, when we were slaughtered as animals and we were beheaded because we did something wrong, etc. The blood uh, is more than the four great oceans. Uh. Mm. And similarly, for the tears that we shed uh, on the round of rebirths, uh, is more than the four great oceans. Uh. So it is only by understanding uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, really understanding. Uh, to understand the Four Noble Truths, uh, uh, we also have to understand, for example, the five aggregates of attachment, the six sense bases or dependent origination. Uh. So uh, some people don't understand. <clears throat> they think uh, the Four Noble Truths uh, is just elementary Dhamma. But it's not elementary Dhamma, it's the ultimate Dhamma. If you really understand the Four Noble Truths, uh, then you become an Arya, one of the eight types of Arya, or you attain liberation. Then the Lord, while staying at Koti Gama, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom com becomes completely free from the asavas, that is, from the asava of sensuality, of becoming, of false view, of wrong views, and of ignorance. Then the Lord ha had stayed at Kotigama as long as he wished. He said, Ananda, let us go to Nadika. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Nadika, where he stayed at the brick house. And the Venerable Ananda came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, the monk Salha and the nun Nanda have died at Nadika. What rebirth have they taken after death? The lay, <coughs> the lay follower Sudatta and the lay woman follower Sujata. The lay followers Kakuda, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tutta, Santutta, Bada, and Subada have all died at Nadika. What rebirths have they taken? And the Buddha said, Ananda, the monk Salha, by the destruction of the Asavas, attained in this life through his own super knowledge the uncorrupted liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom. The nun Nanda, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn 
and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. The lay followers who datta by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion is the one's returner who will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. The lay woman follower Sujata, by the destruction of three fetters, is a stream winner, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. The lay follower Kakuda, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from that state without returning to this world. Likewise, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisaba, Tutta, Santutta, Bada and Subada. Ananda, in Nadika, more than 50 lay followers have, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, been spontaneously reborn and will gain Ibana from that state without returning to this world. Rather, more than 90, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion, are once returners, Sakadagamin, who will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. And well over 500, by the destruction of three fetters, are stream winners, incapable of falling into states of war, certain of attaining Nibbana. <coughs> Ananda, it is not remarkable that that which has come to be as a man should die, but that you should come to the Tathagata, to the Tathagata to ask the fate of each of those who have died. That is a weariness to him. Therefore, Ananda, I will teach you a way of knowing Dhamma called the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Aryan disciple, if he so wishes, can discern of himself, I have destroyed hell, animal rebirth, the realm of ghosts, all downfall evils, fates, and sorry states. I am a stream winner, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. And what is this mirror of Dhamma by which he can know this? Here, Ananda, this Aryan disciple is possessed of unwa unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Thus, this blessed Lord is an Arahan, Samasambuddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct, welfarer, knower of the worlds, incomparable trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He is possessed of unwavering unwa faith in the Dhamma. Thus, well proclaimed by the Lord is the Dhamma, visible here and now, timeless, inviting inspection, leading onward to be comprehended by the wise, each one for himself. He is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha. Thus, well directed is the Sangha of the Lord's disciples, of upright conduct, on the right path, on the perfect path, that is to say, the four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of humans. The Sangha of the Lost Disciples is worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, worthy of gifts, worthy of veneration, an unsurpassed field of merit in the world. And he is possessed of morality dear to the noble ones, unbroken, without defect, unspotted, without inconsistency, liberating, uncorrupted, and conducive to concentration. This Ananda is the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Aryan disciple can discern of himself, I have destroyed hell, I am a stream winner, certain of attaining Nibbana. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha says, huh? uh, is telling Ananda, if you keep asking me huh, where each uh, uh, lay disciple, uh, uh, each disciple is uh, uh, reborn, uh, that will be very wearisome. Uh. But I'll teach you uh, how to see uh, whether you have become an Arya. Uh. The Buddha says uh, uh, the minimum is the um, stream winner, uh, here referring to the Sotapanna. Uh, the Sotapanna has these four qualities, uh, has unwavering faith. Uh, uh, unwavering confidence uh, or sadda in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha, and he has the Aryan Sila, Aryan uh, um, uh, Aryan uh, morality. Uh, uh, this Aryan morality, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, consists of the three factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, like right speech, 
right action and right livelihood uh, and basically consists of seven precepts uh, uh, three body precepts not to kill not to steal and not to engage in sexual misconduct and four verbal uh, precepts uh, not to lie not to carry tales uh, to cause disharmony not to engage in uh, coarse vulgar words and fourthly, not to engage in idle gossip. Uh, so, uh, these seven precepts are extremely important. If you have these seven precepts and you learn the Dhamma, then there's a good chance you can understand and become a Ariyala. Uh, then the Lord, staying at Nadika in the brick house, gave a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. And when the Lord had stayed at Nadika as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to Vesali, where he stayed at Ambapali's grove. And there the Lord addressed the monks. Monks, a monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. And how is a monk mindful? Here a monk abides contemplating the body in the body, earnestly, clearly aware and mindful, and having put away all hankering and fretting for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind and dhamma, that is how a monk is mindful. So this here, uh, mindful refers to the sati, la, sati sampajanya. Here it says mindful and clearly aware. Uh, so here sati uh, is a practice of contemplating the body in the body. La. Uh, contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, and dhamma in dhamma. Uh, having put away all, here it says hankering and fretting. Uh, in other uh, translation, uh, they say coveting and dejection. That means uh, uh, don't covet, don't uh, crave uh, for the things in the world. Uh, if you crave for things in the world and you cannot get it, and then you experience dejection. Uh, here they say fretting. Uh, so it's the practice of sati. And then the next one is the practice of sampajanya, which is uh, uh, general, general mindfulness, lah, general awareness. Uh. And how is a monk clearly aware, sampajanya, sampajano? Here a monk, and going forward or backward, he is aware of what he is doing. In looking forward or back, he is aware of what he is doing. In bending and stretching, he is aware of what he is doing. In carrying his inner and outer robe and bowl, he is aware of what he is doing. In eating, drinking, chewing and severing, he is aware of what he is doing. In passing excrement or urine, he is aware of what he is doing. In walking, standing, sitting or lying down, in keeping awake, in speaking or in staying silent, he is aware of what he is doing. That is how a monk is clearly aware. A monk should be mindful and clearly aware. This is our charge to you. Uh, so here the Buddha is telling the monks uh, that uh, all the time uh, you should be uh, you should practice mindfulness of these four objects of sati uh, don't let the mind stray uh, and to, to help you practice that uh, you should practice uh, general mindfulness uh, whatever you are doing uh, put your mind there uh, instead of letting allow, allowing the mind uh, to stray and think of this and that. Uh, mm. A lot of people, as I mentioned before, uh, don't have this, uh, even this basic mindfulness uh, being present. Uh, uh, the mind is always going off somewhere. Uh, mm. Now Ambapali, the courtesan, heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali and was staying at her grove. She had the best carriages made ready and drove from Vesali to her park. She drove as far as the ground would allow, then alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was. She saluted the Lord and sat down to one side. And as she sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted her with the talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, Ambapali said, Lord, May the Lord consent to take a meal from me tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. The Lord consented by silence, and Ambapali, <clears throat> understanding his acceptance, rose from her seat, saluted the Lord, and passing him by the right, departed. And the Lichavis of Vesali heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali, 
and was staying at Ambapali's Grove. So they had the best carriages made ready and drove out of Vesali. And some of the young Lichabis were all in blue, with blue makeup, blue clothes and blue adornment, while some were in yellow, some in red, some in white, with white makeup, white clothes and white adornment. And Ambapali met the young Lichavis, axle to axle, wheel to wheel, yoke to yoke. And they said to her, Ambapali, why do you drive up against us like that? And she said, Because, young sirs, the blessed Lord has been invited by me for a meal with his Sangha of monks. And they said, Ambapali, give up this meal for a hundred thousand pieces of money. And she said, Young sirs, if you were to give me all Vesali with its revenues, I would not give up such an important meal. Then the Lichavi snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman, Amba woman. We have been cheated by the mango woman. And they set out for Ambapali's grove. And the Lord, having seen the Lichavis from afar, said, Monks, any of you who have not seen the 33 gods, just look at this troop of Lichavis. Take a good look at them, and you will get an idea of the 33 gods. Then the Lichavis drove in their carriages as far as the ground would allow. Then they alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was, saluted him and sat down to one side. And as they sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted them with a the talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, they said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal from us tomorrow with his Sangha of monks. But the Buddha said, But Lichavis, I have already accepted a meal for tomorrow from the courtesan Ambapali. And the Lichavi snapped their fingers, saying, We've been beaten by the mango woman. We've been beat, cheaten, cheated by the mango woman. Then having rejoiced and delighted in his talk, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passing him by the right, departed. Hmm, stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, these young men uh, from Lichavi, uh, they... Uh, these Lichavi young men, they uh, uh, have a lot of blessings, uh, and they uh, they look they look very good, uh, and they are very wealthy, and uh, so they dress up very well. Uh, and the Buddha said, uh, if you haven't seen the thirty-three gods, uh, look at them. Uh, they look exactly like the thirty-three gods. So this shows uh, that uh, some human beings, uh, we have much blessing from the past. Uh, we have been uh, reborn from the heavens uh, down here, so we still retain some of this uh, uh, blessing. Uh, so the looks, everything. Uh, uh. And Ambapali, when night was nearly over, having had hard, choice hard and soft food prepared at her home, announced to the Lord that the meal was ready. Having dressed and taken robe and bowl, the Lord went with the order of monks to Ambapali's residence and sat down on the prepared seat. And she served the Buddha and his monks with choice, hard and soft food till they were satisfied. And when the Lord had taken his hand from the bowl, Ambapali took a low stool and sat down to one side. So seated, she said, Lord, I give this park to the order of monks with the Buddha as, as its head. The Lord accepted the park, and he instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted her with the talk on Dhamma, after which he rose from his seat and departed. Then while, then while staying at Vesali, the Lord delivered a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom, etc. Mm. Let's stop here for tonight. Uh, so here you see uh, this Ambapali, uh, she had a lot of faith in the Buddha. Uh, and uh, so she donated uh, this uh, piece of land. Uh, here it's called a park. Uh, it's like a, uh, uh, how do you say, botanical garden like that. Uh, I don't know what trees they are inside there. But uh, she donated it to the Buddha. And the Buddha accepted it on behalf of the Sangha. Uh, 
This Ambapali uh, is uh, said here said to be a courtesan. Courtesan is like a geisha uh, 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 to to be more costly, uh, like a high class prostitute. Uh, in those days, uh, it was a respectable profession, uh, just like the geisha girls of Japan. Uh, so um, we find uh, in the theory gata there are some verses. Uh, uh, by this uh, Ambapali, uh, which shows, uh, because she became an Arahan, uh, it shows that later she became a nun, uh, became a nun and practiced very hard uh, and became an Arahan. Uh. This is a very long sutta, so it will take a few days, so uh, we stop here. Anything to discuss? There's no indication given in the in the suttas, la. So we don't know. And uh, this uh, particular part, na, how how close it is to the Buddha's final days, also we're not sure because when they compiled this sutta, they just collected certain in- incidents uh, and put it inside here. La. Uh, in the Vinaya books, also we have this incident, and it's never mentioned uh, that it was at the last stage of the Buddha's life. La. That that one um, hard to tell, and we find some of these parts, uh, the different parts of the sutta here, they're repeated elsewhere. So it could be uh, that they compile uh, uh, certain certain incidents and just put them into the sutta. Hard to tell which uh, whether there's any sequence or not. This is um, yes. This is true, la. We find many people. La. Uh, they their development la, is not balanced. La. They strive for certain uh, practice, certain things, la, but certain other things, and they neglect. La. So it's very important la, to always uh, look inwards. La. Look inwards. La. A lot of people always looking outside, na, looking at other people's fault, na, but never see their own fault. Na. But uh, other people can see in them. Na. So all this uh, stems from the ego. Na. So it's very important na, to reduce our ego. Na. I find some many, many, many of our uh, lay followers, uh, after many years or so, uh, their ego does not go down. Uh, it's very important uh, to reduce the ego, otherwise you're not, much, you're not making progress uh, on the spiritual path. Uh. It's easier for a monk uh, to reduce the ego because having given up every, everything, uh, uh, a monk has no property, uh, no name, so uh, he has to beg for his food some more. Uh, so. It's much easier for a monk to reduce the ego. For lay people, especially uh, if you have, you have, uh, you think, uh, you have uh, wealth, you have property, and all that, uh, then uh, they cling to the ego. Uh, and so I find sometimes uh, uh, 
a people, uh, they can't tolerate each other. Uh, so that's very bad. Uh, you must always remember that uh, if you don't make progress uh, while you can, uh, later on you'll regret. In the, I think in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha mentions uh, there are some lay people, when they see a monk, they don't get up from their seat. Uh. And then another type of lay people, when they see a monk, they, they show respect, uh, probably say, by, by standing up and inviting the monk to, to, to sit down or something. And then there's another type who's a bit more advanced. Uh. He not only uh, stand up, invite the monk to sit down, uh, he go and find some, something to offer to the monk. Uh, and then, uh, but he does up to there. La. Then another type, uh, he not only offers something to the monk, for example, uh, he might ask some Dhamma questions. Uh, and then there's another, another type, uh, uh, having asked the Dhamma question, uh, they, they don't retain, re, they retain the, the Dhamma teaching. Uh, but uh, 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 another type, uh, they having heard the Dhamma, they, they keep it in mind. Uh. And another type, they not only keep it in mind, they reflect on it uh, and try to understand it better, uh, uh, etc. Uh. So the Buddha said, uh, these people, when they are reborn in heaven, uh, they are at different lev levels. Uh. Those who make uh, less effort, uh, they are at a lower level and then they regret. Uh, oh, Last time I had the chance to do this and do that, I didn't make the effort. And I see my friends now at a higher level. And uh, then uh, those who practice more uh, and they're reborn in a, in a higher level, and uh, then they are very happy uh, that they did, did all those things uh, that they were supposed to do uh, and follow the Buddha's words. Uh. Uh, so it's the same uh, on the spiritual path. Uh, I see a lot of lay people uh, they are willing to do uh, dana, but they're not willing to uh, practice sila well. There are some people, they practice dana and sila, but still uh, are very arrogant, cannot put down the ego, cannot put up their jealousy, cannot put, put down their selfishness uh, towards each other, backbiting and all these things. Uh. So next time when you're reborn uh, uh, in whatever place, uh, you'll regret. Uh. Just like some ghosts, uh, they have the the opportunity to learn the Dhamma and practice generosity and sila, they, they don't. And when they are reborn in the ghost realm, uh, then they regret very much. Uh, we know, for example, uh, there are certain beings, uh, they possess some, uh, especially like some old ladies uh, whose mind are not very strong, and make these old ladies uh, go into a trance and help other people. Uh, and um, so, uh, of course, uh, people not understanding, uh, they say all these gods uh, come to help. Uh, but to me, uh, they can only be ghosts or very low beings. Uh, otherwise, uh, when you summon them, uh, how can they so immediately, happily go into a human body, which to a deva or a devi, uh, a human body is stinking, uh, full of shit and uh, blood and pus and urine, etc. Uh, only low beings uh, like the ghosts uh, will come when you summon them. Uh, so a lot of people don't understand. Uh, if you want to hear more, I can tell you more about this. Uh, but uh, on this Dharma talk, I won't talk about it. Uh, so I can think I, I said enough for now. Buddha said, nah, a wise man can recognize a fool. A fool cannot recognize a wise man. So you, you, you won't be able to recognize. If you're not an Arya also, you won't be able to recognize an Arya. Uh, you cannot ask him also. Because uh, uh, firstly, that is bad manners. Secondly, in the monk's Vinaya, when a monk is asked about his attainment, he is not supposed to talk about it. He can only disclose it to another monk. Because in the Vinaya books, there was some, a time when there was a famine, 
and uh, the monks were having difficulty uh, getting sufficient food. So a group of monks, a small group of monks, uh, they thought of this great idea. They said, why don't uh, I start praising you uh, that you are an Arahan and you start praising me as an Arahan. And then uh, when the lay people get to know, uh, they will give, make us a lot of offerings. La. So they did this. La. And then uh, the lay people started to give a lot of offerings to them. La. Uh, so this is wrong livelihood. La. So after that, the Buddha said, la, you're not supposed to talk about your attainment. La. Mm. I see some lay people are always chasing for this type of uh, monks la, who are highly attained. And many, very often, uh, I find they get cheated. Uh, if any monk uh, claims that he has psychic power, uh, you better run away. Because a good monk will never tell you that he has psychic power. There are some monks who not only say they, some monks hint they have psychic power, some monks say quite directly uh, that they have psychic power. So if you are a fool enough uh, to, to, to chase after these monks, uh, then you, you get cheated. Uh. If there's an arahan in the world, I don't think he will uh, he'll prefer to, to, to spend his time in the forest <laughs> uh, meditating. Uh. In the first place, uh, nowadays uh, it's hard to find an arahan. It's also very hard to find an anagamin because an arahan and an anagamin, you need four jhanas. And people who attain four jhanas, uh, they go into seclusion, hide themselves, uh, don't talk to people, meditate all the time, then only they can get the four jhanas. It's not easy to attain the four jhanas. It's a very deep state where the, the breathing stops. cannot prevent uh, somebody from falling into the woeful plains. Where we go for rebirth is our responsibility. But the Buddha said, uh, those that we love, uh, and if you want to meet them again in the next life, you try to teach them four things. One is to have faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Secondly, uh, to teach them to, be, to practice charity, generosity. Uh, and love to practice charity and generosity. The third, to uphold the sila, moral conduct. Uh, and basically, uh, the sila, moral conduct, uh, refers to the seven precepts, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, help them uh, to get wisdom. Uh, uh, and to, to get wisdom basically is to uh, hear the Dhamma. Uh, mm. So these are the four things uh, that if you want to meet somebody else, uh, they, these four things you have to have uh, to be similar. You've got to have a similar faith, have the similar uh, uh, generosity or stinginess. Uh, the, and the third is the same uh, moral conduct or immoral, immorality. Mm. And the fourth is the same same wisdom or stay, same stupidity, uh, you'll be reborn together. Mm. Also, these are the four things the Buddha said. Uh, if we want to repay our parents' kindness, we should teach them these four things. Okay. Um, I have a question. How many people are there in the Say again, how can a person be mindful? Which uh, mindfulness from the heart when a person takes? How can a person reach a mindfulness from the heart when a person takes? How can a person attain mindfulness by meditation? Is it? Mm -hmm. huh? uh, how can a person attain mindfulness by meditation? Uh? Firstly, you have to make the effort to be mindful. Uh? That means uh, uh, you don't sleep so much, 
Uh, in the Buddha's teaching, uh, in the Buddha's, the, the Buddha's disciples are not even allowed to sleep. They are allowed to rest. Uh, of course, if they can't help themselves, they fall asleep. Lah. But the Buddha uh, wants his the disciples uh, to remain mindful all the time. No? That's why there's one practice called uh, Jagarya Nu Yoga. Uh, what's uh, devoted to wakefulness. Devoted to wakefulness means uh, not sleeping. Uh, so there was a time when uh, some young monks uh, were in the in the hall, uh, in the Dhamma Sala. Uh, this is this is known as a Dhamma Sala where the Dhamma is taught. Uh, and then after the teaching finished, uh, uh, the senior monks all went to the kutis. So these young monks probably they sat there talking and then fell asleep in the hall. Then in the middle of the night, the Buddha came to them and rebuked them uh, for sleeping uh, without mindfulness. Uh, so the Buddha standard is very high. You want to be mindful, you have to practice mindfulness as much as you can. Uh, even if you are very sleepy or so, uh, the Buddha's standard is that you try to take a rest uh, without falling asleep. Uh. Mm. That's why you find uh, if you have a good afternoon sleep uh, and then when you meditate in the evening, you are not able to meditate because you, are, you allow your mind to run, 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 run. Uh. So if you are very tired, uh, it's good to get a cat nap. Uh. After f 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, quickly get up. Mm. If you're not able to do that, some people put a, a timer, put a timer. Then you get up. Mm. So, but it also depends how 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 physically exhausted you are, la. If you are more physically exhausted, then you need uh, you need to rest more, la. Uh, So you have to 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 judge, la, Your what is the uh, minimum you can do it. Uh, so the general mindfulness uh, is not to allow the mind to run uh, thinking of this and thinking of that one simple way to do that uh, is to do chanting uh. the buddha taught his disciples to chant the 32 parts of the body uh, head hair body hair nails teeth skin flesh a new bone bone marrow kidney heart liver midriff spleen lung like that uh. so if you can't do that uh, then you chant something simple like namo buddhaya Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. Uh, or Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama Sambuddhasa, like that. No? You keep chanting, uh, not to allow the mind to run. Uh. When you don't allow, when you, when you don't do some work, uh, you don't, uh, with your mind, uh, then the mind uh, will start running. Uh. That's why they say an idle mind is a devil's workshop. Uh. So you have to keep the mind working all the time. No? Uh, chanting is a very good way. La. We are sweeping the floor, you chant. Uh, we are cutting vegetables, you chant. Uh, mm. So that is uh, practicing uh, mindfulness. And then uh, practicing sati is different. Sat practicing sati uh, is putting your mind on one object. For example, your breathing. Uh, uh, but that is more difficult. La. More difficult. So it's easier uh, like to do chanting. Chanting also is a type of meditation. Uh, just to uh, constantly chant uh, the same thing over and over again and not allow the mind to run. Uh. So if you practice Satipatthana, but Satipatthana means intense state of mindfulness. Intense means uh, you don't allow the mindfulness to run. Uh, you keep your mindfulness on one object, for example, on the breath. Uh. You keep your mindfulness on the breath all the time. If you are able to do this all the time, then the mind will become one-pointed. And they attain jhana. Mm. Some people think you meditate only when you sit down and meditate. No. When you're not sitting down also, you, you should, you should you be, don't allow the mind to run. No. Mm. Yeah. At what stage of this uh, person or monk uh, can exudes matter? <coughs> whereby uh, maybe the monks, whereby when you go there, when you sit in front of them, you can feel the sort of matter. You know, that that is a kind of psychic power, you know, to be able to radiate that matter. It's a kind of psychic power. 
In the in the suttas we 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 read uh, that you practice that after you attain the first jhana, after you attain the first jhana, then only you can start radiating out. No, no, no. That is uh, uh, falling asleep and dreaming a lot. Probably you dream a lot, but you you know about it. Probably you don't dream at all. Somehow you wake up and say, "I couldn't sleep for two months," but somehow you still feel very. No, you know, uh, scientists have found out uh, that the uh, dreams uh, are short-lived. Uh. Normally. Uh, when we wake up, uh, we will have forgotten the dream. La. But there are times when we remember uh, when you are suddenly woken up. La. For example, the alarm clock suddenly sounds uh, and then you wake up. Uh, ah, you know what you were dreaming about. Or when you were sleeping uh, and suddenly a, a lightning, uh, thunder, uh, strong thunder, and then you wake up, uh, then you know that uh, what you were dreaming about. Otherwise, uh, you keep dreaming the whole night, nah, and you, you, but you wake up, nah, you've forgotten what you dreamt. That's proven by scientists. Nah. Mm. Another question is, uh, at what stage of on the development, which stage of the can one communicate with the animal? For example, you know, when I was at the retreat, uh, the place there are a lot of monkeys. So the first evening, when we were meditating, there was the monkeys were jumping all around the place and you know, they were making all sorts of things so we couldn't meditate at this. But the next day, when the evening is all quiet, so we asked our teacher, he said, yeah, he said, last night I meditated. She didn't tell me what she does up and tell them that they are free. And uh, please uh, you know, uh, go somewhere else to play and this and all. And that works for the rest of the trip, it was absolutely quiet. Under normal time, the monkey is all over the place. By what stage of development they have done, whereby they are able to do that? I'd rather believe, huh? that the monkeys went off on their own because uh, I know the nature of monkeys. They go from place to place uh, looking for food. They stay in a place and they eat whatever they can find. Uh. After that, they will move and move and, and, and after a long time, they come back to the same place. That's the nature of monkeys because I've observed them. Sometimes after this group of monkeys goes away, and after a few days, uh, another group of monkeys come. Because this group of monkeys, uh, they travel in packs. They always have a leader. And they move from place to place, place to place. sleep eight and a half hours, uh, then uh, uh, that is optimum from the worldly point of view. La. So a normal person uh, is, a norm, is a busy person when you work uh, a nine to five uh, and you have a lot of frustration in the office and all that. Uh, so you need that, that, that number of hours of work. But the Buddha and his disciples, uh, they don't have that type of uh, uh, stress. La. Uh, and also because they are pushing themselves to the limit. Uh, that's why uh, they try uh, not even to sleep. Uh, because why? 
Their object uh, is to be mindful 24 hours a day. That is when you become an arahan. If you are able to maintain your mindfulness uh, 24 hours a day, uh, you can become an arahan. Because an arahan uh, is uh, said in the Vinaya books uh, to be mindful 24 hours a day. And you cannot fault an arahan uh, for anything. Because he cannot do anything anything wrong because he is mindful twenty four hours a day. So if your object is to be twenty four hours to be mindful twenty four hours a day, eh, you can't hope to do that by sleeping eight and a half hours a, a night, nah. See? So what is your object? Your object is to be a normal human being, and then you sleep eight and a half hours a night, nah. If your object is to be an arahan, nah, it's completely different. It's not just loneliness, it's uh, being happy. You know, the Buddha uh, in the suttas, uh, it is said, uh, um, what is difficult to do in the Buddhist religion? Some, uh, somebody asked this uh, Arahan, and he said, uh, what is difficult to do in the Buddhist religion is to renounce, because we are attached to the family. Uh, there's a sutta given uh, with a very beautiful simile, of the elephant, the wild elephant in the forest. If you want to tame a wild elephant, firstly you've got to catch him and pull him out of the forest. And when you pull him out of the forest, uh, he's very ill at ease. He wants to go back to the forest. So he'll try to you know, rebel and all this thing. And uh, so you have to speak nice words to, to that elephant and slowly give him food and all that. Nah. So. So in the same way, if somebody is, is, is used to the lay life and he comes to wear the rope, for example, he feels very uncomfortable. Uh, used to uh, maybe watching TV show until 12 o'clock at night, uh, play, playing with your computer until 3 a.m. or something. And then you come here, you have to go to sleep at 9 a.m., <laughs> 9 p.m. and wake up at uh, 3.30 or 4, 4 a.m., uh, uh, when a lot of people, uh, they are used to sleeping at 3.30 3 or 4 a.m. <laughs> so, uh, then after that, uh, after the, the, the Aran was asked, uh, so if a person can renounce, uh, what is difficult to do? And then the Arahan said, uh, if a person has, after a person has renounced, uh, it, is it is difficult uh, to, to be happy. Uh. Why is it difficult to ha be happy? In that sutta is not explained. Uh, but unless uh, you can tame your mind, uh, you can uh, attain uh, tranquility of mind, calmness of mind, uh, the mind will disturb you. Uh, so so uh, if you are able to tame your mind, uh, then you can live alone. Uh, then you can uh, find happiness living alone. And after you are used to living alone, uh, meditating, and then you don't, don't like to, 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 to have a lot of people talk to you. <laughs> you, you, you don't enjoy talking, enjoy quiet. Mm. You see a lot of lay people, they enjoy talking, spend all their time talking. Mm. And uh, they're so used to it, uh, even when they come to a monastery, uh, they find uh, if they, they don't have somebody to talk to, they find it very difficult to pass the days. Uh, they, even this happens with some monks I've seen. Always looking for somebody to chat. <laughs> okay, shall we end here for tonight?